So on to today. Um, the title of my talk, what I want to share about, I've actually liked the two um, titles that I came up with last week and this week is, um, this week is, please, please come to my pity party, please. <laughs> and when we embarked on our theme for the year of um, be a vessel for transformation and using as a plan, as an operating guideline, integrating the 12 steps of AA along with um, the 12 promises of AA, combining them with 12 spiritual principles and 12 action steps that we can take to enhance, improve, heal, move forward, increase, expand, deepen our awareness and our deeper in our relationship in spirit and God, I knew that that would be 48 Sundays. And so that leaves four Sundays to kind of be free. And you throw in Mother's Day and you throw in Thanksgiving and you throw in and then you got to somehow work in Father's Day and Mother's Day to make it all fit together. So today, as we further in, um, deepen our um, exploration of the sixth step, which is we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Last week, we looked at the spiritual principle of willingness. And today, we look at the promise, the promises of AA, which in the sixth step is that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. So I got to combine that and weave it all in together with Father's Day. So it's a simple, a simple process that kept me up till midnight last night. That's right. That's right. So to introduce what I want to share about and, and as far as weaving the Father's theme in with this promise is one of the great contributors to whether or not we feel useful or useless whether we value ourselves or we feel pity towards ourselves, was greatly influenced by our relationship with our fathers. And what I really want to point out, and I really, this is about my 11th time to speak on Father's Day in my ministerial career. For many years I didn't have a church when I was just doing the workshop full time throughout the North America. Um, so obviously there was many Sundays where I didn't speak on, or many years I didn't speak on Father's Day, but this is about my last 11th sermon on Father's Day. So I'm always looking at different approaches and different angles to take at the same subject because I'm the only one that's been present at all my other 11 Father's Day sermons. And I don't ever want to ever tell the same story or bore myself with something I heard before. So I really looked at what's a different approach that we could take. And that's where I want to set up what I want to share is in the last 150 years, 160 years or so, a huge transition has been occurring in defining the role of a man. We no longer, as men, have to be hunters, farmers, builders, protectors, and providers in the same way that we were called to do so 160 or more years ago. And the reason I'm using that term roughly 150, 160 years ago is I'm referring to the pre-industrial revolution time. The Industrial Revolution, for those of us that remember history and, and facts and all that stuff from our past, refers to a change from hand and home production to machine and factory production. And when the Industrial Revolution started here in North America, it impacted the time and really began from 1820 to 1870. But what it was about was calling people off of the farms into the cities. And what the Industrial Revolution set in motion was the need for men to redefine their roles in society, in the business world, and most importantly, in their home life. You see, for so long, we were, prior to the Industrial Revolution, what? We had a, a piece of property, a piece of farmland. And we farmed. We had to build our own cabin, our own home. We had to be engineers in designing our corrals and our barns and all those sort of things. And we had to go out and hunt. And we had to cut trees down and have wood. And we had to think ahead. We had to be planners and think ahead for the winter. And what all provisions we needed to get us through the winter when our grounds would be covered with snow. And, and we were the protectors of the family. And we carried guns and we had weapons and we had to hunt. And now we have to go to the store. You know, for many of us, the closest that we come to farming is Mitchell's. <laughs> for many of us, the closest that we come to being hunters is buying some eggs off a roadside farmer. So we have shifted, and so what it did is it took out the foundation of what our ancestors had led us up into becoming. 
And what we've been struggling, I believe, since then as men is defining what is our new role in today's world. Now that we're not farmers, hunters, providers and protectors in the same way. So it has caused a great shift. And what we're in the process of creating is new generations of compassionate and sensitive men. And this is not coming easy, is it women? <laughs> we're doing it in, in helping us, thank you. Most boys are taught from an early age to act tough and repress their emotions. To act tough and repress their emotions. Males who repress their emotions have created a planet on the brink of disaster. Since most male world leaders behave in an argumentative and combative manner, rather than exhibiting compassionate and cooperative behavior. We are at a turning point for the planet in which our male political leaders can either continue acting in an insensitive, belligerent manner, risking the destruction of humanity, or choose a new collaborative, understanding approach to foreign economic and environmental policy. One important way to stop the current political and corporate destruction of our planet is through mentoring those that are coming after us, through mentoring our young men, who will become the future leaders of the world, to become more compassionate and loving to all human beings and Mother Earth, for fathers, for uncles, for grandfathers, teachers, coaches, or any man who comes in contact with young boys to help them become compassionate and sensitive human beings. The time is now for us to create a new vision for our world. Mentoring young men to develop their sensitive and compassionate qualities is definitely a challenge in society filled with gender stereotypes. While there have been some changes in the last 25 years or so, they have been more dramatic for girls than boys. According to Isabel Cherney, a Creighton University psychologist, she says, for girls nowadays, it's okay to play with boys' toys, to dress like boys, and talk like them. Boys have to walk a much finer line. And many times I'm not sure is as women, if you understand this fine line that men have to walk, it's really impossible if you've been a woman most of your life. <laughs> it sounds funny, but my brother-in-law has become my sister-in-law. Honest. These things happen, as Kate says. And so I understand that there are transitions that take place in all kinds of unique ways. But understanding this, this much finer line, and our fathers tend to be more stereotyped in the raising and parenting of a boy than they do to a girl. Telling them not to deviate, telling young boys not to deviate from what's typically seen as masculine. So men in the room, see if you were not raised by that father that had this perfect ideal of what a masculine boy should become. Women now make up close to half the enrollment in US law and medical schools. There are no statistics like that readily available for Canadian law and medical, but I'm assuming it's about the same. But thinking about that, 50% up from less than 25% just a few decades ago. Huge shift there. Yet men continue to shun nursing as a career, comprising only about 8% of all registered nurses. Many dads still get upset if they see their son playing with a doll, which surely doesn't contribute to men becoming nurturing parents. William Pollock, a pre professor in the psychiatry department of Harvard Medical School, you know that, that minor university, has written, Many fathers are torn over gender role issues, supporting the concept of less rigid stereotypes, yet worried that their sons might be ostracized if they partake in activities viewed by their peers as unmasculine. We still socialize boys to follow their more aggressive side rather than their more thoughtful and caring side. We're basically telling boys that the worst thing they can be is a girl. So most real men, 
Real men can cry and express fear. But most men remember incidents from their boyhood when their dad or coach told them that famous line, act like a man. The part that doesn't go with that act like a man, it doesn't say in that little sentence, but what is implied is don't show any emotions, don't be weak, don't be tender, don't show compassion, don't be empathetic, be tough, shut down, and be angry at it, about it. Act like a man. For women, there's many statements that have, have put you in your place. That's the one that puts boys in their place. Act like a man. And the men in the room, I hope you're, you're hearing what I'm saying. How many times were we implied, you're not being a good man. You're not being a strong man. You're not showing machoism. You're, you're being tender and sensitive. That's not how a man acts. Especially when a child expresses fear or cries. Listen to this line. Being shamed for expressing emotions is hurtful for any boy, resulting in his repressing all emotions except for anger. And you want to see what happens when the lid comes off and our emotions can be expressed? You need look no further than Wednesday night. A little liquid courage, spectators, bystanders that are needed in the mob to, to energize the mob mentality. When we shut down our emotions and then we're giving a keyhole, an opening, a doorway to let them out, it can come out nasty and ugly and disgraceful. So by repressing our emotions, except for anger, which is the only emotion considered okay for so long for males to express. I want you to get that. That's such a strong, powerful statement. I've been teaching the opposite for 23 years. For many of us as men, that's what we were taught over and over. It's only okay to show the feeling of nothingness or anger. A boy needs reassurance. And men, ask yourself this as a boy coming up. How many men did you have reassure you from a role model as a male role model, that it is masculine enough, that you are masculine enough just as you are. So when a man shames a boy for expressing his genuine emotions, the boy's self-esteem plummets, and the boy is giving the message that he has to repress his true self to be accepted as a man. And I bet I'm speaking to every man in this room, or close, to repress our true self. And I'm probably not only talking to the men, but how many of the women in the room were growing up, grew up in that, in that, with a father that you had to repress your true sensitive side in order to be accepted as a man. And that repression of self is what deteriorates our self-esteem, which leads to the forming of the pity party of setting up future pity parties. Because at some point we're going to start feeling sorry that no one sees us for who we are. That no one sees us for who that gifted little boy that we really are. No one sees our, our happiness and joy because we've, learned, we've had to repress it. Imagine growing up in a home where you have to repress your joy, your happiness, your enthusiasm, your creativity. Because little boys don't paint. Little boys don't play musical instruments. Little boys don't dance. Little boys don't sing. You need to act like a man. That's not what a man does. You need to repress that. So when we start repressing our authentic, true, real self, because we're afraid to show the spiritual qualities that we all came into this world possessing, which is our joy, happiness, enthusiasm, excitement, passion, intensity, inspiration, all that sort of thing. When we have to start repressing that, sooner or later we bottle enough of that up that's what creates the energy that we start feeling sorry for ourselves because we can't be who we want to be. And when we start feeling sorry for ourselves, what do we want to do? We do one of two things. We either want to enroll people in feeling sorry for us, or we want to rage, or we have to learn to control that behavior through our addictions. You've got to numb it out some way. So we become workaholics. That's acceptable because that's what a man does. A man works really hard to provide for his family. When the sun comes up and when the sun goes down, you're working in between. 
Even if that means sitting in an office, 10 by 10 cubicle, not looking at anyone, just looking at a computer screen. Act like a man. We weren't like that 150 years ago. We were out farming, hunting. It's hard to make that transition. 150 years is nothing in a period of time of shifting our persona, our personalities, who and what we are, our stature, our well-being, the foundation of who and what we are in this world is not a quick process. We've been yanked off the farm into the city and said, here, redefine yourself. Who is showing us currently how to redefine ourselves? Who is the male role model that us as men are patterning ourselves after today? It can't, I can't find anybody in Hollywood that I want to pattern myself after. I can't find anyone in the political system that I want to pattern myself after. However, I was impressed with the, the mayor of Vancouver. Gregor, I'm sorry, I can't remember his last name. The guy appears to be, be an impressive man. May, uh, we hope, I, I hope at this moment, without knowing anything more about him, that he progresses along. But who is it in the sports world that we want to pattern ourselves after? Who is it in the spiritual world right now that's a present day teacher that we're learning to pattern ourselves after? Not a whole lot of models out there that have stepped up and said, here's what it takes to be a man. What most of us have been gifted with is figure it out on your own. You know how my dad taught me things? First time I went out on his farm as a young man, 14 years old. We're driving, um, first time I'd been in a tractor, in a, about a $70,000 tractor, now would be $200,000 tractor. This is 1974. We're going down a, a 100 acres. My dad and my family, which you probably don't know, have been wheat farmers for the last 65 years. So I still have the ancestral genes in me to be a farmer. I love the land. If I go out and pull weeds, I still feel good. It's not the same as farming 500 acres, but it's farming. In my head. So here we are, we're driving down. You ever been in a, in a crew cab of a tractor? There's not a lot of room, it's made for one person. My dad was not small, at, at, and at 14 I was 6'1". And so here I am with my 6'3", petite, 280-pound dad and myself in a, little, in a little cab. And we're driving the first time. You drive really slow. You've never been in a tractor. They don't go very fast. And, and, and here we are cultivating down through the rows. And he says, after the first, ra ro first ride, first pass, five-eighths of a mile, he says, you got it? I said, got what? He says, you know how to drive this? I don't know. And I turn around, and he stepped out of the tractor while we're moving. Go, he says, go. That was my driving lesson. Two hours later, he comes back and he says, how'd you do? And I said, I don't know, look at the, look at the field. <laughs> Actually, I didn't do too bad. I've always been able to drive things. That's how I was taught. No, let me show you how everything works. Get in and drive. You'll figure it out. My dad didn't throw me in the swimming pool and say, learn to swim. But that's how he taught me most things. Here's a ball, throw it. There's a stove, cook. Those sort of things. Anybody else learn that way? So who right now is mentoring, is modeling to us what it means to be a successful man in this world? I've had to figure most of it out on my own. I never remember, I never will forget when my dad left at, at my age 13 and our water heater broke. And I'm 14 years old and we didn't have very much money. My dad didn't support us financially for quite a while. And I'm trying to figure out how to put a thermostat at 14 years old because we didn't have money to call it plumber. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out how to put this stupid thermostat in to a water heater. And you know what I knew about putting out in a water heater? There's the water heater. It warms our water. That's what I'd been taught. Didn't know how to fix it. And I remember how long I struggled with that thing for hours and hours until I kind of got it right. And then thankfully, my brother-in-law came over and fixed it in about 10 minutes. But how many things like that were we not modeled? Or did we not have a mentor to show, here's how we be? And then we look at, well, who showed us how to be a man in this world? Who showed us how to be a sensitive man in this world? We had men that perhaps taught us what it means to be that macho man. But we didn't always have that man that said, here's what it takes to be that compassionate, loving presence. According to authors of the very successful book, Raising Cain, Jan, Dan Kildren and Michael Thompson says, quote, Dads treat their daughters differently than their sons. Research, research has shown that fathers treat their infant daughters more gently than they do their baby boys. As the children grow up, fathers tend to show their sons less physical affection, correct them more often, and play more competitively with them. 
This behavior by male role models definitely doesn't encourage young men to behave in a caring and compassionate manner. Many men have a difficult time relating to or supporting their boys when he pursues activities that are outside the act like a man box. One man said, I wish my dad had recognized that there are different ways of being masculine. When I played clarinet in high school, my mom went to all my concerts, but my dad would not come. Perhaps to get my dad's attention, I finally decided to go out for the soccer team, even though I didn't really like the sport. Why? Why? The only time my dad acknowledged me was when I played soccer and he actually went to see me play on Saturdays. I guess I learned at a young age that I had to deny my real self to get my father's love. How many of us in here have denied or attempted to deny a part of ourselves in order to get loved? Whether we did it as childhood, if we learn to do it as children, we may be learning still and carrying that pattern on as adults. That we've got to deny a part of what we want, of who we are, in order to fit into somebody else's perspective and expectations to get the love we want from them. Men and, women who still, men and women who still subscribe to the outdated belief that boys shouldn't cry or show fear would do well to let go of the cookie-cutter model of masculinity. Seeing your son or boy as an individual, someone who will express his masculinity in his own way, will help you feel closer to your boy, your son, and help him thrive. Many men need to question their own beliefs about what it means to be a man, and be open to looking at new definitions of masculinity. Men who mentor boys need to be aware of how damaging it can be when very aggressive male behavior is extolled in the media. For example, I was recently in a bookstore and I picked up a book about how fathers should raise their sons. And I was alarmed to read and listen to this quote. So I copied it down. Take your son to a hockey game. Boys love the fighting. While many boys enjoy aggressive, stimulating team activities, I don't think encouraging exposure to violence is ultimately helpful for any boy. We witnessed that very clearly on Wednesday night. So actually, it's fine for boys to play competitive, strenuous sports like hockey as long as the consciousness, the consciousness, the sum total of the thoughts and actions of the coaches and players is supported and caring toward the participants. Unfortunately, we still live in a culture where winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, which, could only, which can turn any sport, even badminton, into a match to destroy the comp competition at all costs. It's important for you to stand courageously against the ideal that a real man must always be tough and unemotional, as well as talking often with your boy about the meaning of masculinity and what it really means to be a man. It will be helpful to reassure your boy that he doesn't need the approval of aggressive boys, of athletes, or the alpha male at school or on the team to feel good about themselves. It's also essential to frequently affirm when your boy expresses compassion, fear, sensitivity, and vulnerability. The difference between being a strong and sensitive man is to make sure that you always defend your boy or your son if others shame him when he expresses his true emotions and frequently praise his sensitive attributes. Men in the room, when we were growing up, how many times were we praised for our sensitive attributes? And women, if you wonder why it's hard for us to be sensitive, listen to that response. To have compassion for how difficult it is for us to break that pattern. And it's only been occurring in the last 30, 40 years as whole, as on a wholeness, as a collective group. So we're still talking about a relatively new idea, a new way of being for men, to be sensitive, to be gentle, to be vulnerable. This is not something we've been doing for 2,000 years. As a male role model, we need to learn to express our feelings as well as be able to show our vulnerability. When you express your full range of emotions, you will be setting an example for a boy that a real man can be a fully functioning human being. A real man, rather than living in the act like a man box. 
Be a role model for the boys, for those generations that are coming behind us of the diversity of masculinity, including the softer side of being a man. And that's what I feel I have done a really good job in my lifetime of standing in front of people. Because if you've been here for any length of time, you know I have no, no problem about showing my emotions. And if you think for a moment I'm not tough, piss me off. <laughs> And I think I, I represent really the, the transformation that is taking place in manhood as I stand in front of you with a suit or with a tie on in a leather jacket. It's my Father's Day present, and my kids wanted me to wear this. And it's actually a healing for a pity party that I'd been carrying since the last relationship that I had left. I'd purchased a really, a really nice leather jacket, about like this one in Southern California, and my ex-girlfriend kept it. It was extra large. <laughs> kept it. <laughs> Along with a couple other million dollars, I wanted the jacket, though, for God's sakes. And I've been whining since then. I don't have a leather jacket. I don't have a leather jacket. I, it's black, but it's not leather. <laughs> so now I can't whine anymore when Crystal and the girls presented it to me this morning and said, she said, that, And going 48 years without having my own child, to have my daughter run into the kitchen this morning, yeah. and that little two and a half year old girl look at me and say, Happy Father's Day. Yeah. Pretty good deal. Yeah. So, she gave me this book, Why I Love My Daddy. And I wanna share it with you. I love my daddy because he is big and strong. I love my daddy because he is clever. I love my daddy because he keeps me safe and cozy. I love my daddy because he plays with me Not sure about that hippo idea, though. <laughs> I love my daddy because he carries me. Yeah, thank you. I love my daddy because he is handsome. <laughs> when they're two and a half, they can think of every good thing about you. I love my daddy because he is funny. I love my daddy because he hugs me good night. I love my daddy because he fixes things. Hey, I put her bed together. I love my daddy because he tickles me. I love my daddy because he is kind. I love my daddy because he has the best ideas. <laughs> oh Lord, if she only knew what she has in store for her. <laughs> Everyone loves their daddy, especially me. What a nice book. So men, what does it take for us to really show up fully in life? to become that, to combine and to move away, but still embrace the protector, the provider, the hunter, the farmer. With the part of us that is compassionate, loving, vulnerable, intimate, open, and actually listens, not in between nodding and, and watching the game, but actually listens and values those around us. What does it take to make that shift? to combine the two, because we still need to be protective of our family. It's gonna be really difficult. My girls have my promise, my solemn promise, that no one will ever harm them as long as they're in my care. But to also be vulnerable 
as I read that book this morning, I stood there with the tears just coming down in between cooking, <laughs> reading the book, multitasking. But my girls will never, will not go long without seeing me with tears. So what I know that I'm impressing into them is that when they start entering into relationships in another 20 or 30 years, <laughs> that the man they choose will have to be vulnerable, will have to be respectful, will have to be loving and compassionate and empathetic and a good listener. They'll have to be, or my daughters won't have room for them in their life. I'm doing my best to model to them, and it's been difficult. It's been difficult to figure so much of it out on my own. But you know what? I eventually learned how to become a really good water heater installer. <laughs> and the next seven years I went to Texas, I could drive any piece of equipment I was put on. And I can play any sport just about and play it well but I also know that I can share my heart. I can do that well. And the pity party that I used to carry about how my dad never showed me, how to be a sensitive, vulnerable man, I'm thankful for that lesson because it also gave me a real clear image of that part of me that I need to learn to be and I could only learn that on my own. My dad wasn't able to teach me and that's okay. But what I found is that other men throughout my life have shown me what it's, that it's okay to be sensitive, that it's okay to be vulnerable. I had plenty of being tough. I had plenty of that side. If you saw my brother, my brother it defined what it meant to be tough. But he also defined what it meant not to be sensitive and vulnerable. And I know that when I feel vulnerable and open, and available emotionally and, and, and mentally, God, do I feel much better. I can act like a man for a while, but that part wears on me. But boy, does it feel good to just be a man and just be my true, real, and authentic self as all of you are showing up here, being in life. And it's not easy to go through war the life being vulnerable feeling more sensitive than those around you, but knowing that inside they too want to feel sensitive and vulnerable. And the roles that we are setting and redefining here are awesome and they're important. They're important for those that will come after us. So what kind of a role model are we right now being? There's never a time that we're not being watched. Never a time, whether it's at work, out in the community, in the privacy of our own home, we're always being paid attention to. So how we're being paid attention to is very important that we set that role model to being that loving, helpful, powerful, masculine presence in this world.